speaker this year is Dr. Scott D. And I know that uh, you know Scott, a DVM from University of Minnesota and a PhD from the University of Minnesota. Used to practice in Western Minnesota with, in Morris with Dr. Rod Johnson and Nate Winkleman and, and uh, Al Carlson. And that, that practice, you remember, was affiliated with Janetta Pork, and, which has become a, um, at least a North American, perhaps global leader in, in the genetics industry. And, and then we were able to recruit Scott to come back to the university full time in 1999. And in 11 short years, nobody clearly has made more impact on the biosecurity of PERS virus than Scott. He's really dedicated his professional career at the university to that. And in, in sort of recognition of that effort in particular, as Scott will tell you, as he is finishing up the research farm, we thought that we really need to have Scott summarize that 11 years of effort. And that's what Scott's going to do with us this morning. So please welcome Dr. Scott D. I'm really honored to have the opportunity to present the Hansen Lecture. I remember Jim Hansen and Al Lehman starting this program many years ago, back in the days of the Earl Brown Center. And it's grown so, uh, so wonderfully. And I recognize the work that Chuck Casey, Jan Swanson, and now Alicia Johnson are doing to carry on the legacy of Jim Hansen, an outstanding CE from the University of Minnesota. So it's a great uh, lecture and a great honor for me. Okay, a little business before we start the story. And it's an exciting story, and I can't wait to tell you. I'm so pleased to be here, but I need first to recognize and to thank and also to disclose my sources of funding and in-kind that have been so generous to us over the years. And you see some very important organizations listed on this, on this slide. PERSCAP 1 and 2, National Pork Board, Minnesota Pork Board, a number of very important uh, industrial partners, especially our Swine Disease Eradication Center partner group. This group is listed here, all the corporate and practice members. This group provides about $300,000 now a year for our research efforts at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine, supporting graduate students, pilot project research, as well as operating our research farm. And I know there are representatives from all of these organizations and practices in the audience today, and I'm truly thankful for all you do for us. You saw some air filtration companies on that list, and while I enjoy working with them and they're wonderful people, I have to disclose to you that there is no financial connection between the results you're going to hear today in regards to air filtration and uh, any other decisions that are going to be made. These are scientific data. They're science-driven results. They are not financially motivated. So you see the slide here. For transparency's purposes, we have to disclose this. Now, I need to thank some special people, a lot of who are here today and have helped me so many times over the years. First of all, for helping me get the idea of an infectious disease research farm off the ground, which was a very out-of-the-box idea for a university. But because we had a very understanding at that time department chair, who is now our dean, Dr. Trevor Ames, who is here today, and Dr. Tom Molitor, they helped me get this idea off the ground. And I appreciate that effort. For embracing the vision, of the research program. Two of the best graduate students you will ever find. Andrea Pitkin, who's almost finishing her DVM, and uh, Satoshi, some real special people. You're gonna see their efforts highlighted today. Mr. Jeff Zick, Jeff Zick is a friend of mine. He's here today. He's the vice president of Genetopork. Jeff and I go a long way back. He and his company have provided our research efforts basically for no cost on an unlimited supply of PERS virus naive and mycoplasma haunemoniae naive animals. That's a huge resource. You can't put a dollar value on that resource or on the friendship we have. Thanks, Jeff. Mike Murtaugh, when Mike directed CAP1, he was the first person who saw some vision and some potential value in our production region model approach. And he helped us get started with some funds from CAP1. So thank you, Mike. For his genius in statistics, the great John Dean, there's nobody better. You'll see his work highlighted. And three very special people who have become great friends of mine, I'm proud to say, wonderful practitioners from three great clinics in southern Minnesota. And we're so lucky to have these relationships at the university with the practices. I want to acknowledge for trusting in the science, 
have been encouraged to bring it to the field and apply it and become pioneers really in large scale air filtration. Dr. Gordon Sprong from Pipestone and his group, Dr. Darwin Reichs and his group from Swine Vet Center, and Dr. Paul Ruin in the Fairmont Veterinary Clinic. It's just an honor to ride in the truck with those guys. Lisa's here. I need to acknowledge her and my family. You see our children, Nicholas and Ellen, pictured here at the Canyon of the Yellowstone. Uh, we're always believing in me. I have a great personal life. And finally, this lecture is dedicated to two very good friends of mine who have helped me personally and professionally many, many times over. Dr. Rod Johnson, my former partner in practice in Morris, for teaching me to think big, and Dr. Tom Berkren, our executive director of the ASV, who has taught me to always take the high road. And these are qualities I hope to demonstrate today. Okay, let's set the stage here. This is the most important lecture I've ever given in 23 years of being a veterinarian. That's a little pressure for me, okay? Now, the chance to tell this story that I've been waiting to tell for so many years to this segment of the industry with all the decision makers and leaders here, I've got you captive in one room at a time when we're discussing the future of PERS in North America and what to do with it. That's an opportunity of a lifetime. So this is a true privilege and an opportunity for me. And again, I'm just thrilled to be here. Okay, the story I'm gonna tell you has three chapters. The first chapter is entitled, What a Long Strange Trip It's Been. That's the eyes of the presentation, the story's vision. The second chapter are the five drivers of change. That's the heart. And the third chapter is Unite in the Clans. And that's the spirit. Let's get started. Chapter one. What a long, strange trip it's been. Those of you who are Grateful Dead fans will recognize that title and the text on the slide. Now, I'm a Beatle fan. I'm not a big deadhead guy. But every time I hear this song, I think about Purrs, especially these lines. I think about Purrs when I'm eating breakfast, so I mean, but let me explain. Sometimes the light's all shining on me. In regards to Purrs, to me, that says, that's the time when we think we got this thing figured out. We got negative pigs, the virus is quiet, programs are working, we're in good shape. Other times I can barely see, boom! A new variant has emerged in the countryside, programs fall to pieces, animals are dying, producers are upset. We can't see our hand in front of our face, we've been there. Lots of you know what I'm talking about. But lately, meaning the last three or four months as I've sat down and put this together, it's occurred to me what a long, strange 20 plus year trip we've been on with this disease. Now, my own long, strange trip began in 87, coming out of Minnesota. In the early 90s, I experienced PERS, like many of you. In the mid 90s, I studied PERS with Han Su as a PhD student. And from 99 to the present, I've researched PERS. And so, if you do the math, I've experienced, studied, and researched, and devoted 40% of my life on this planet that we just heard about to PERS. Now there's two ways of looking at that. One is, wow, focus, persistence, dedication, well, yeah, yeah. The other way is probably a little bit more realistic, and it's unfortunately how I look at myself more often than not, and how the virus would look at me too. <laughs> there's the virus giving me the big L. Can you spell loser? I can just hear it laughing, you know. You try to destroy me for 40% of your life, you fail every time, you fool, you must get your head examined. <laughs> That's true, but it's too late. I'm, I'm, too, I'm too into it, it's too, I can't turn back now. Okay, now, our long strange trip as an industry has been filled with a few ups and downs. While we've tried real hard to do a good job, many times we fight ourselves harder than we fight the disease. Three examples to support that statement. Back in the beginning, 89 to 91, there was no collaboration during the search for the cause. Nobody was working together. 2004, we all got really angry over vaccine patents and things. 2006, there was a lot of dissension about the ASV position statement on PERS eradication. Now, I wrote that as a president with some help from Paul Roon, and I was a bit mystified by the, the, the reaction in a lot of the, the membership, you know. I got a bit down that the fact that well, veterinarians were actually leading an eradication call for the first time. Well, shouldn't that be a good thing? 
but oh, there was a lot of dissension, and I got a bit depressed. And that's really when Tom Berkman came through and gave me some great words of wisdom and advice that I've carried through uh, from that day forward. Is he said, Scott, don't worry about that. Always take the high road. Keep your head up. Keep a positive attitude. Keep working hard. Things will change. Things will get better. And he was right. He was right because things have changed. In 2009, a year of transition and healing, a lot of stuff happened in 2009 for the better. And I was so pleased to see AASV leadership. President at that time was Butch Baker. And Butch stepped forward said, hey, this position statement is right on. We've got to talk about what we're going to do for our country's purse status. It's a good thing to think about. Let's discuss. Great leadership. New discoveries came out. We'll talk some about those later. Stevens County momentum. People started to see what was happening in West Central Minnesota when producers and practitioners actually started to work together. What could be accomplished? And then influential voices spoke up at key times. And I remember Tim Lola last year, right here at this meeting, his keynote address. Maybe it's time for the big one. Thinking, you know, that's, he was saying, guys, we've got to do something about purge. Maybe it's the right time to start working together and getting this thing going. And that momentum, that positive vibe, rolled into this year, 2010, what I'll call the dawn of a new era. And right out of the box, in March of 2010, big things happened. The industry spoke. The, PERS, uh, the NPPC resolution on PERS elimination passed at Pork Forum. And you can see the resolution here on the slide. And there are some highlighted bits of information there that are very important. A united goal, support and identify resources, not make eliminating the virus a government mandate. Key leadership by producer delegates at a crucial period of time. And now, as the veterinarians spoke in 2006, the producers have spoke in 2010. And then the industry acted, and acted fast. This is a slide from Dale Polson and his BI Area Solutions team, showing you all the various area regional control and elimination projects for PERS that are ongoing now in, in the United States. You know, we used to have just one going on in Minnesota. Look at what's happened real fast. There's projects all over the country, and we're talking about PERS positively. We're acting on it positively. We're making progress. What happened? How did we turn from such a negative subject matter, where we couldn't even have a discussion, to not only are we discussing it, we're getting stuff done. What facilitated this positive change? Well, as I sat down and put this together, to me, I identified five forces five drivers of change that helped us turn a negative into a positive, that helped us shape that positive attitude. And you can see them listed here on the slide. And I'm going to take them one by one, and let's break them down. All right, each driver has a premise. So driver one is understanding. And the premise of driver one is we understand our expectations. I think for the first time, we understand where we are going and what we have to do. For example, we understand that. This is a voluntary program. You saw that in the resolution. This is not regulatory. No one's talking restricting pig movement. Let's just take that discussion off the table. It will be market driven, not federally mandated. There's a faction of the industry, including myself, who believe the government won't even be involved in this because the market's going to drive it. Because of the profitability of PERS virus naive wean to finish, once the industry, the critical mass of the industry, understands how profitable that performance is, the industry and the market will drive and protect area regional control elimination. It'll be strategic and science-based. Right now, it's a pilot project focus across these various projects in low-density regions. And those pilots, we're learning things. We're developing standardized templates. We're sharing information. We're replicating results. And with that information, we'll move, and that same approach, we'll move into high-density regions. Okay? So it's very science-based, because those plans will change with new information, and it's very strategic, a pilot project focus. And it's a team effort. That's our mantra. We can't do this independently. We have to do it collectively. So those are the components of the first driver. We understand our expectations. Let's look at number two, necessities. 
The premise for our driver number two is we have what we need to get started. For example, we have the tools and information to eliminate virus from farms. We can do that. Sure, there's a number of ways to get it done. We can diagnose the disease, actually in very real time these days with molecular technologies and electronic reporting. We can get our results within hours instead of, uh, instead of days. We can map a region. We have GIS. Yeah, we can do that. We can measure infection risk. We have the pad wrap. Internal, external risk, grow, finish, breeding herd online. We can do that. And we now understand areas spread so much better. And I'd like to take that point and build on it. Because area spread of PERS virus has been the linchpin of elimination for so many years. And you know the story. Yeah, I cleaned up the farm and it got infected with a new virus. I didn't know where it came from. Everyone's upset. Yeah, truly so. And for many years, we've understood how the virus moves around the countryside mechanically, right? Fomites, bugs, trucks. But it wasn't until we started to understand the aerobiological component of area spread that we started to get confidence that we now understand this and we can do something about it. We know, what, we know where the gun is. We know where the bullets are coming from in many cases. And I want to highlight some of the work that Jeff Zimmerman's group has done from Iowa State University and that our group has done because it's been a nice collaborative effort to bring some answers to this issue in regards to PERS virus aerobiology and the science behind it. So for example, we now know that in regards to PERS virus aerobiology, important differences exist between variants. In other words, not all viruses are created equal in regards to their ability to spread by the air. For example, the frequency of viral shedding in aerosols is dependent upon variant. Some of Jenny Cho's work from our group. The infectious dose 50 in aerosols varies between viral isolates. That's some work from Jeff's students, Joe Herman and Tim Cutler. And then just the ability to transmit via the airborne route, again, can vary by isolate, Jenny Cho. We also know from, again, Joe Herman from Jeff's lab, that the half-life of PERS virus and aerosols is influenced by temperature and relative humidity. Now, we built on that, and we published recently in virus research some risk factors and meteorological conditions associated with the presence of virus in air. For example, if, you, if there is an airborne transmission event, you need, first of all, a source. You need a source population, actively infected, shedding virus in bioaerosols. You need directional winds, taking that viral plume from the source towards an at-risk population. And those winds need to be moving at low velocities to protect the integrity of that plume, but with intermittent gusts to move it across the landscape. And in conjunction, you need cool temperatures, high relative humidities, rising pressures, and low sunlight levels, similar to dusk or dawn or cloudy days. And for the visual learners in the room, if you want the Cliff Notes version, here you go. High risk, low risk. That's basically what it says. And we also know that the virus can be transported across long distances via the air. Satoshi's recent publication demonstrated out to 9.1 kilometers. That's as far as we looked. And here's a figure from his paper showing you the point source where we had an infected population. And the five points radiating from that source where we found air samples containing infectious PERS virus that were sequenced and shown to originate from the source, that were titered, and we determined the concentration of viable virus in those samples, and we demonstrated that it was indeed alive via swine bioassay. So, all that work, if we had to sum it up and give you the 30,000 foot big picture view of the Im industry impact of that work from Jeff's group in collaboration with our group, all components of area spread have been identified. Long distance airborne spread of PERS virus has been proven. And risk factors such as the environmental climactic risk factors have been quantified. All right, we understand our expectations. We have what we need to get started. What about innovation? What, has new, what have new tools brought forward? The premise of driver three, innovation, is science solves problems. Problem one, how do we conduct or improve our ability to conduct large-scale regional surveillance for PERS? Solution, oral fluid sampling, a new tool. 
Problem number two, if the virus can go a long distance by the air, how do we prevent that? Solution, air filtration. I'd like to take both of these innovations, these new tools that have helped raise producer and practitioner confidence in our ability to conduct large scale area regional control elimination and talk about them. Now, I don't know if Jeff is here, but Jeff Zimmerman, okay, good, hey Jeff. Jeff Zimmerman is the best PERS virus researcher in the world. He's been there since day zero. He's done the foundation work in persistence, transmission, viral ecology, and epidemiology. But as an applied person, applied scientist, this, Jeff, this is your best stuff. This is so cool. Because it's not only scientifically rigorous, like everything you do, it's so practical. And it works. And lo, so many people are using it. And we know how it works, you know, you put the ropes in the pen, the pigs love the ropes, up they bite them, you get the fluid from the ropes, you send it in, you test it for virus or antibody. Simple brilliance. You know, it's, I almost could call it simple genius. It's, it's so convenient and simple, yeah, it's just genius. It's working so well. In the industry, it's truly solved a problem. And I went back and I looked at a number of papers that this group has put out with John Prickett and some other students of Jeff's. Look at what they've come up with in a very, very short period of time to bring you information you didn't have a few years ago. Look at all this stuff, and you'll hear more about it today. But protocols for oral fluid collection at the pen and individual animal level have been developed. PCR assays for detecting multiple agents in oral fluids, not just PERS, multiple agents have been validated. The sensitivity of detection of PERS virus in oral fluids is superior than serum, Anti-based, antibody-based uh, assays are on the, on the way and promising results have been put together. And the stability of the virus and antibody in oral fluids is very good and so we handle this sample just like we would any other routine sample. That's a lot of work. That's new stuff you didn't have. That's new, a new tool. And look at the industry impact. If you take again the 30,000 foot view, we now have a cost-effective, welfare-friendly means to efficiently perform regional surveillance we don't have to bleed pigs anymore. It's gonna to get to that point, okay? That is big. Oral fluids will replace serum as a sample of choice. And as I mentioned earlier, this works for other things. SIV, PCV2, just to name a few. Congratulations, great work, Jeff. Innovation number two is one we've been working on, air filtration. I have to credit the French if there are any French veterinarians here from the swine industry in France, this was their idea, it wasn't mine. I went to visit uh, some of the filtered farms in Brittany, 2004, and they were interesting clinically, but there weren't any data to support that the filtrators were actually working. They were very costly because they used positive pressure and HEPA filtration. I didn't think that would work here in our country across a large scale. So the research question I had when I came back from France is how do we properly test this idea? Now, that brings us into about 2005 and the calendar of things. 2005 for me, if I could speak from the heart, was a very, very challenging year. It was a time of reflection and self-critique. And I often found myself feeling like I was right out here on this little edge of this cliff because I'd been at the university for six years. I'd been promoted to full professor. I'd published 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals. I'd gotten all sorts of grants and awards. So I gave myself, I think, a grade of a B plus or an A minus, maybe for my academic performance. But I gave myself an F for my industry performance. My impact in the industry, I gave myself a failing grade. Because while we had done all these nice experiments with flies and pipelines and snowballs, we hadn't solved the problem of area spread. It was still going on. Producers and practitioners were under pressure. So here was an opportunity with air filtration. Could this be something? I could potentially deliver to the industry to finally have done something of value. And so I found myself creeping closer and closer to the edge of that cliff because I was thinking, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna test this? How can I best develop some type of an experimental model to really, really test this thing? And that's where I heard the voice coming back from 12 years in Morris, Minnesota. The voice of my old friend, Rod Johnson, one of the biggest thinkers in our industry. He continues to do this, to think big, to think innovatively, out of the box. And I could hear Rod, I could hear him in my head. He said, Scotty, you gotta think big. You gotta think 
big, big, big. You've got to do something bigger and better and more different, more out of the box than you've ever done anything before. Now get to it. Okay. That's Rod. Rod reminds me of the guy who built this castle on top of a hill. All right. So the outcome of all those mental gymnastics following the challenge from Rod was what we call the production region model. The objective of this was to develop a model of a swine production region endemically infected with PERS virus and evaluate routes of transmission and protocols of biosecurity. To develop a model of a neighborhood of pork production, a Martin County, Minnesota model, a Sioux County, Iowa model, a Sampson County, North Carolina model, where there's farms in such close proximity that virus just kind of bops between them, probably by aerosol currents. And our hypothesis was, if we could control aerosol spread of PERS virus, we, then we can protect pig populations. So what a great way to test this model. Now this is a picture from a figure that we just published in Virus Research showing you the layout of the model at this time. And we're going to finish it up this November. We're bringing it to a close, as Bob said. But in the model, we've got four facilities to represent four farmers in close proximity to one another. The, the one up in the corner, the blue building, building one, that's our source population. That's the producer with a bad health status. He's got PERS, he's got MHIO. He's the source of the bioaerosols downwind to challenge the neighbors, 120 meters away. There are three other producers. One that has an industry standard biosecurity plan, so an intervention for everything except air filtration. The other two have filter systems. And because we've got multiple buildings, we can test multiple interventions at the same time. Now, putting a pencil to this whole thing, as Bob mentioned, it's been running for some time. It was actually kind of scary when I finally added everything up. This project has been running for 1,401 days. It started with Andrea, 2006, June 1, and it's finished up with Satoshi. As of today, it's run 1,401 days. Multiple pathogens have been tested in the source population, including three current variants of PERS virus, 184, 1182, and 1262, and MHIO. We've utilized 4,714 pigs. Thank you, Jeff. We've tested three classes of filters. Remember, when we came back from France, they had the HEPA model. I knew that wasn't going to fit everybody. We needed options. Producers need options. Not every budget's the same. Buildings are different. Risk management levels are different. We had to come up with some options. So we've been able to test mechanical, antimicrobial, or electrostatic filters. And during this whole period of time, we have collected 34,223 samples to track the virus moving through the model and to ensure that our pigs are either getting infected or remaining free. These samples have been of air, people, fomites, insects, transport, and pigs, and they've been tested by a variety of molecular means. Now I need to take a second to thank and acknowledge Jim Collins and Kurt Rosso and their staff at the Molecular Diagnostics Laboratory at, at, at the University of Minnesota. All of these samples have come in real time across this 1,401 days to Kurt's desk. They've all been processed and reported without a hitch. I could have never done this study without our laboratory in the university. Now, over time, we've measured two primary outcomes. Airborne transmission of PERS virus or mycoplasma, hyonomoniae, or airborne transport of the two pathogens. Let me show you some real big data slides across this whole study that kind of summarizes each of these two outcomes. So an airborne transmission event is documented and confirmed in our model first with the recovery of an air sample that has a virus coming from our source. Okay. Then we detect the virus in air as it enters our non-filtered control through the inlet. Okay, that's point number two. And then the pigs get infected within that non-filtered control building. That's point number three. So we connect the dots with sequencing and show that the sample originated from the source, it moved through the air, it infected the pigs. That's an airborne transmission event for PERS virus as well as the same philosophy for mycoplasma. So in our control facility, which is again the non-filtered control, you can see here, we've conducted 63 replicates over this 1,401 days where we've assessed PERS virus airborne transmission. Now a replicate is two to four weeks long. This is a long time. You can see that 33 out of 63 times 
we have documented, as described, a PERS virus airborne transmission event in that non-filter control. As with 17 out of 37 replicates, mycoplasma how pneumonia airborne transmission event. Now, look at the differences between the control and the treatments. Big differences, highly significant. No airborne transmission event has occurred in any filtered facility that we've been testing so far, be it a MERV-16, a MERV-14, an antimicrobial, or the electrostatic variety, which we're just wrapping up. We're not done yet. That's a big difference. Now, what about airborne transport? This is a little different. This doesn't have the pig infection component. It's just looking to see whether an air sample carrying virus can breach the filter barrier. So can we collect the bug on the other side of the filter bank? Can it get through the filter bank? All right, so the outcomes we've been measuring have been number of air samples that are PERS virus positive by PCR and the number of air samples that are MHIO positive by PCR. In our non-filtered control, over the 1,401 days, we have collected 826 air samples. 64 in the control facility have been PERS virus RNA positive. In mycoplasma terms, 636 air samples, and what do we have? 23 have been MHIO DNA positive. So airborne transport is occurring through that control. Now, when we look at the MERV, like take the mechanical and electrostatic, add them all up, a lot of samples, no transport, all negative data. We look at the p-value as compared to the controls, highly significant. Now, if we look at the antimicrobial data, because it's a different filter type, it's made differently. It works differently. So we have found a small number of positive samples for PERS virus or MHIO in the air coming through this filter. And we look at the p-value and compare it to the control, we see a non-significant difference. This doesn't say this filter is poor or deficient. It's basically because it works differently. So what's the industry impact of all that 1,401 days? If I had to sum it up into two things I'm most proud of, what have we demonstrated? That in regards to preventing airborne transmission of both agents, all filter types are equal. Options. In regards to preventing airborne transport, that's a little different story. There are differences across filter types, and so you have to understand your management, your risk level, your building type, you know, which filter is best for you based on your, build, your willingness to, uh, to measure and, and deal with risk. All right, now, none of that would have any value at all if we couldn't take it out on the farms and solve that problem. That's why we did it. And this is where I have to bring in and acknowledge the work that the practices have really carried this ball. Gordon, Darwin, Paul, and their colleagues from their clinics have really, as I mentioned, had courage to take information from this teeny-weeny little research farm. That's not a very big place, is it? And put it into the real world. Put it into boar studs. Put it into sow farms. These guys get a lot of credit for having the courage to do that. And uh, quite a while ago, they had that idea. And they put it into boar studs, problem solved. This, these three practices, I think, have over 25 boar studs now that are filtered. There has not been an infection of PERS virus, MHIO, or airborne SIV for up to five years in these boar studs. Problem solved. I think we overlooked that. We forget how well the air filtration system worked at the bore stud level. Slam dunk. South Farms, bigger challenge, current challenge. Let me show you some preliminary data from a study we're doing in conjunction with those practitioners, with some of their clients in swine dense regions, looking to see if air filtration really works in big breeding herds in swine dense parts of our country funded by CAP2, National Pork Board, Minnesota Pork Board. Project participants, of course, Minnesota, South Dakota State University, Steve Pohl, agricultural engineer who puts all these systems together, and the three practices. The duration is four years, and we're measuring, let's see how often filtered farms get infected when compared to non-filtered farms. And at the end of it all, let's calculate the cost benefit. All right. Two years of data so far. Here are the treatment herd data. These are the filtered farms. Ten filtered farms have qualified based on our inclusion criteria. Eight of ten still remain negative to external virus introduction now two years post-filtration. Two of ten have become infected. The cause of these infections have been, in one case, contaminated transport, which we validated with diagnostic data. In the, sec in the second case, a personnel breach at the D&D &D room where we 
uh, observed some interesting uh, happenings on security camera. Okay, now some people would say, failure, two farms fail. I don't know if that's right. Because let's look at these two farms in regards to their frequency of infection before filtering versus their frequency of infection after filtering. And this isn't a complete analysis because we don't have equal periods of time, but let's talk about this for a minute because I think it shows a different light on those two farms. The breeding herd inventories, they're both over 3,000 sows. Both are in very dense regions. There's 17 farms within a 4.7 kilometer radius of farm one. There's nine farms within that same distance of farm two. No pigs from the south farm feed these surrounding sites. So these farms are under siege, probably 24-7, 365. How often did they used to break before they filtered? Well, let's go four months, I'm sorry, 48 months, four years. Historically, there were seven breaks in the one farm. There were four breaks in the second farm before filtering. Now that's an infection interval or a frequency of infection in the first case of one every seven months versus one every 12 months in the second case. The, the 24 months post filtration, yeah, we've had one break in each farm. That's one break every 24 months in both cases. That's a big difference between one every seven and one every 12. So, what about the controls? What about the herds that are of similar size, they're in swine dense regions, they've got industry standard biosecurity, but they don't have filters? 26 farms have participated in this group over the same two year period of time. The data are fairly self explanatory. 24 of those 26 farms over that two year period of time have become infected with new viruses. 13 of the 24 have been infected once. Nine of the 24 have been infected twice, and three poor buggers, or two poor buggers, they've gotten infected three times in the same two year period of time. All right, so preliminary thoughts, because yes, we need more data. This is clearly not end of story here. We gotta prove sustainability over time. We gotta measure cost benefit. But things look pretty good so far. Now we're getting into crunch time this fall but I want to lay this data out here for you to look at and be familiar with our current project so as we visit about it in the future, you'll have a baseline. And I think this point here in the bottom is so important. Filters aren't magic. They aren't a guarantee that PERS virus infection is not going to occur through another route. I clearly believe it'll always stop the airborne route. It's, it's black and white on the airborne side. But the virus can get in many different ways, can it? And so we've got to have a plan, a program, a comprehensive approach for all known routes. And because of the work with area spread, we can do that now. And that's some impact. That's something you didn't have a few years ago. We can put plans together that are science-based, and air filtration is going to be part of that plan in swine-dense regions. I believe, as we learn more about it, as we've shown with mycoplasma, its ROI will increase because it's going to be uh, effective against multiple airborne viruses and bacteria. And I think the issue is no longer the technology. It's not whether the filters work or not. I think the science is fairly well documented. It's the implementation. Who wants it bad enough to get it in place, train the people, oversee the biosecurity, and reap the rewards? That will separate the winners from the losers. Okay. We understand our expectations. We have what we need to get started. Science solves problems. Teamwork, driver four. The premise of teamwork is we, not me. And the driver, the one that's really changed the game in regards to area regional control and elimination has been the Stevens County Project. The first of its kind proof of concept model in western, west central Minnesota. which showed what people can do when they work together and it's inspired other projects across the country. Now Bob is going to talk about regional PERS projects today in the afternoon, so I'm not going to steal any thunder. I'm going to move forward into driver five, but driver four is essential, because of course we have to work as a team. Driver five is education. Premise, our message is clear. When we educate our constituents, we have to speak clearly, calmly, confidently, and consistently. We have to deliver a clear message. And I would propose 
that we base that message on the following principles and fundamentals that we've been talking about all this time. This is a voluntary program. It will be market driven, not federally mandated. It will be strategic and science based. It will be a team effort and we have what we need to get started. I think if we take this approach and do it the way we know how and teach and educate, we will spread that nice clear message and we'll get buy-in. So in summary of chapter two, the drivers of change bridge the gap. They affected a positive change. They turned a negative into a positive. But they didn't do it individually. They did it collectively. They worked as a team. Because individually, they're only words, see? But put them together, we have a message. They deliver a message, don't they? See how that works? A message that takes us into chapter three. The third and final chapter of the story. Unite in the clans. The spirit of the story. A number of you have asked me in the last few days, what do you mean, uniting the clans? How does that relate to PERS? Simple. Uniting the clans is a call for us as an industry to band together in an effort to eliminate this virus from North America. It's a call for action, not argumentation. It's a call for bonding, not bickering. And it's a call for collaborating, not conflicting. It's also a charge and a challenge to all of us to put aside personal and professional differences that have arisen in this last long stage 20 year trip, to mend fences, to bury hatchets and leave egos at home on the shelf because we don't need that baggage anymore. It's gonna get in the way. This is a big job and we've got a great sense of urgency and we need to work together to get it done. Uniting the Clans is also an attempt to raise awareness that right now in our history, today, this minute is a moment in time, in history, and in truth. A moment of truth. Because we've got some decisions to make with this disease. We're at a crossroads in North America. So which direction are we gonna take? Are we gonna go forward with elimination, strategically, scientifically, doing the best we can? Are we gonna go backwards, or give up and go home? Are we gonna go side by side, back and forth, spinning our wheels, making no progress? Now. I bet every one of you in this room knows what direction we need to go, don't you? We need to go forward. Because the veterinarians called for it in 2006, the producers called for it in 2010. The two groups are speaking the same message. Now they need to unite and speak with a common voice, work as a common team, and follow a common path for the common good. I know it's gonna to be tough, it'll take time, We'll make mistakes, I know it. That's okay, we'll work together as a team. We'll share our resources, our knowledge, our innovations and necessities and make progress as best as we can. And with every new invention or discovery from the research laboratories, we'll make even greater progress. But new discoveries aside, I still believe we can achieve what we want to achieve because we have the world's greatest resource already. We have people, we have you. And from my vantage point, what a sight do I see. Hundreds of my colleagues, inspired, motivated, dedicated, passionate, intelligent people, who if they'll just work together, could do something that's never been done before. We can make such progress if we just get together. The intelligence quotient in this audience is astronomically high. I feel the passion. I feel it up here, it's fiery red. And I see leaders throughout the audience who know what I'm talking about. It's ready to get started. Now, unfortunately, a few people didn't show today who need to be here. Need to hear this message, didn't want to come and, and hear it. I talked to them ahead of time, couldn't convince them. And maybe there's a few of you thinking here that, well, this is all good. It's a good idea. But can we really do it? Are we ready? Do we have what it takes? Now, I pity the first group who didn't show, but I respect that group who's still on the fence. Because we have to be strategic and science-based, and it's human nature to be conservative. But for those of you who aren't certain 
exactly which direction we should follow. Come with me now on a little imaginary trip into the future. Imagine with me. Many years from now, at the twilight of your respective careers, maybe with your children or grandchildren sitting by your side, what would you give, I'll ask you, for one chance, just one chance, to look them into the eyes and tell them the story about how you, as a member of a team, made a difference in the lives of men and animals because you, as a team, helped rid the livestock industry of one of its greatest plagues in history. What would you give for that moment, for that chance, for that opportunity? I bet a lot of you would give a great deal and so would I, because that's why we do this, right? Every day, 20 plus years, out we go, fighting the fight, and fight we will continue, and we will win, because now we're going to do it together. And we have to do it, because our industry needs our help. If you listen real close, you can hear it crying out. It's not crying for just a few of us. It's crying for all of us. Because everyone here is important in the eyes of the industry. Everyone has a voice and opinion that needs to be shared. Everyone has talent that can be used to make a difference. Everyone here today is an equally sized brick in a great wall. But only can that wall serve when those bricks are united. That's why if we unite, then we can truly serve. And if we can truly serve our industry like I know we can with all our talent, with all our passion, with all our skills and resources, then we can succeed. And I know we can do it, because I believe in everybody here in this room, and I hope you believe in me. And we need that belief, that universal belief, that together we can do this. So we're going to close here, but now you know what I mean by a moment in time, a moment of truth, a moment in history, by acting, bonding, collaborating. Now you know what I mean by uniting the clans. Thank you.